In his talk titled The True Man, Myth or Reality, Dr. Jean-Louis Michon, a traditionalist French scholar who specializes in Islam in North Africa, Islamic art, and Sufism, presented a moving autobiographical glimpse into his own spiritual quest and his insights into the true men he has met on that path. Dear friends, dear brothers and sisters in God, I feel very happy and honored to be here with you all animated by the same desire to deeply understand the sense of life and to find and follow the ways that lead to the knowledge of oneself and our neighbor to the door of universal bliss. Before entering the heart of my presentation, I have to clarify the title given to this essay. The expression true man, in French, vrai homme, or homme véritable, is a term of nobility, which a number of nations and communities at all times and in the whole world have chosen to designate themselves. For example, the Berbers of Moroccan Atlas, and largely in the part of the desert of the Sahara, designate themselves with the term imaziren, meaning true men. The same happens on this continent with the names of a number of red Indian tribes, like the Chippewa or Ojibwe's, who live not far from you in Ontario and in the Mille Lacs uh, region of the United States, Minnesota, they used to identify themselves the name An Ish Inabeg, which means true or spontaneous men. Obviously, such designations show the importance and value that these peoples attach to their human status. A similar attitude is reflect, reflected when, in the Islamic world, authors use the Arabic names al-Qawm, which means literally the people, or rijal the men, to designate the whole group of class or class of believers who, in addition to strictly obeying the rules and prescriptions of the Sharia, the law, follow a spiritual discipline, a tariqa, in order to try and gain the proximity of God. In fact, the feeling that we, as human beings, possess a special rank and quality among all creatures has a theological and even a metaphysical background. Well, it is said in the Bible, Genesis 1, 26, 31, that having created man at his image, God was satisfied that it was good. In the Quran, also, Surah 95, verse 4, God declares, Indeed, we created man in the most perfect form, fi ahsani taqwim. So, it happens in the Quran also that God was uh, very shocked and angry when uh, Iblis refused to prostrate in front of the newly created Adam. And God asked him, what hinders you from prostrating before what I created with my two hands? So these two hands, according to an inspired commentator, the Moroccan Sheikh Sidi Ahmed Ben Ajiba, saying that the two hands of God, which these hands which have created a perfect creature, 
are al Qudra, the power, and al Hikmah, that is, two essential qualities of God, and meaning that this create, creator is something really exceptional. So, this means that man, in his prime pristine uh, form, is intimately close to God, so close that he is known as the perfect man. In Arabic, al insanul kamil a denomination which recognizes that God has made him an emanation and a reflection of his own boundless perfection, Kamal. Whence, the attention that has been given in the three monotheistic religions to, and especially among the respective, respective mystic circles, to the doctrine of the perfect man. And I will quote uh, little extracts to show that this doctrine has been really <coughs> a great subject of meditation for the mystics of the three religions. The Jewish mystic tradition, the Kabbalah, analyzes man as situated on three levels in his uncreated aspect before creation. He is called Adam Ilaha, or Adam Kadmon, the divine or transcendent man. As the source of universal spiritual power and wisdom, he is known as Metatron. And as the individual terrestrial man with his three components, which are spirit, soul or psychic, and corporal, bodily, these three levels make a man terrestrial, but maybe perfect too, called Adam HaRishon, the first man, as he was formed and lived in the Edenic world. Adam the one which is described in the Bible and who was, has lost this perfection after the original sin and that we have to try and imitate and recover this primordial uh, nature. In Christianity, the two natures of Christ, true God and true man, have been for centuries a source of rich and sometimes passionate debates. He, he, Christ, totally God. He is the unique one without division, perfect man without doubt, and the same one completely God in the totality of all his members. And in Islam, Finally, a famous treatise on the perfect man, Al Insan al Kamil, has been written by the great Sufi master Abdul Karim al Jili of the 14th century AD. He was a continuator of the teachings of Muhyiddin ibn al Arabi and has exposed how the perfect man is a synthesis of all the essential qualities present in existence. Quotation of Gili, of his book, he is the pole around which evolve the spheres of existence from the first to the last. He is to God what the mirror is for the person who uses it to look at herself. This because God has imposed upon himself to contemplate his own names and qualities only through or in the perfect man. Considering the infinity of degrees of spiritual enlightenment which extend from the perfect man, 
down to the ordinary human beings, it is quite understandable that this sublime entity be generally regarded as a myth, an ideal representation whose transcendent dimension may inspire a silent reverence rather than a longing for approaching or addressing him. We should, however, keep in mind the fact that, as Gili has amply demonstrated, the perfect man is present within every man living on this earth, whether fully, as in the case of prophets and saints, or at various degrees of plenitude, according to the predispositions of each individual. Every human being bears his trace, the trace of the perfect man. He is the kingdom of God within us. The gate which has to be opened so that the divine light penetrates the whole being, driving away the darkness of worldly desires and egoistic preoccupations. How practically can the link be established, or maybe rather re-established, between the mythic perfect man and any sincere seeker of God? The answer is given by God himself, who, having witnessed the weaknesses of the human beings, after their fall from paradise and the degradation of the most perfect form he had created. The models that the religions present us are, well, like Abraham, Moses, other prophets, Jesus Christ, Muhammad, maybe somewhat too impressive for some seekers, especially those who have, have never adhered to a religion, or who are simple believers but without any access to the deeper dimension of their own religion. So these people may have other points to help themselves if they are really uh, seeking the light. And these are the individuals whom I have categorized in a way as true men. They belong to our own uh, terrestrial uh, plane. They have been always there. And recently, certainly all of you have read or have even met, met uh, individuals that have all the qualifications to be entered in that group because they have a natural, they are living with hearts that are naturally pure, purified, very close to the natural, uh, spontaneous uh, estate that they had when created. And these are the uh, people who uh, are still existing within their natural, me, uh, natural uh, med medium, like some Indians that we have met, and I will present one model to just illustrate this category, or they may be people who have had special uh, revelations and who have been guide for their families, for their entourage, or even like the great soul called Mahatma, great soul Gandhi, who with his spiritual strength has counterbalanced the material strength of a whole empire. And these people, well, they were among us and uh, I have had the great privilege to meet some of them whom I will mention 
and the grace that I received, I will try and share with you. We were a group of students in Nancy and uh, associated and had our meetings at the shop of a man who had many books. He was selling uh, second-hand books. And this man was a contemplative. He was a poet, very kind, and he had read something that we discovered. It was Guénon's books. He introduced us to that. So it was a ray of heavenly light fallen on a chaotic and sick world for us. Guénon's first books I read, East and West, The Crisis of the Modern World, were like the truth I already bore myself, had suddenly become the truth with big T, the unique possible explanation for all the aberrations and incongruities that we observed around us and made us feel like strangers in our own milieu. I read several times the book Man and His Becoming according to the Vedanta, in which the doctrine of non-duality and the nature of man are masterly exposed, guided by the principles of universal metaphysics, Guénon explained the progressive deviation that has occurred in the Western world through Renaissance, humanism, and the development of the industrial era of scientists, materialism, when humanity has been progressively detached from the spiritual values which until then had been the foundations of all the great civilizations, including that of Christian Middle Age. Guénon's whole work does not contain a trace of proselytism for one or the other religion. He never claims for himself, nor has assumed the role of a guru. He just was content to expose the traditional doctrines, and he has opened our eyes on the falsity of the pre present ideologies, directed our intelligence toward the immense realm of universal tradition. He has also let us understand that the theoretical knowledge of universal truth is just one step toward the real knowledge, the gnosis, the Irfan, marifa, which can only be acquired within the frame of authentic initiatic institutions and the direction of masters having traveled over the sacred way and acquired the authority to transmit the necessary spiritual influence. When I reached Lausanne in July 1949, everything had been made to facilitate my adaptation to the new situation. Our sheikh had married during the previous year and had moved with his wife to a large residential building where on the same floor a studio had been booked for me. During several years, I lived in the proximity of Sheikh Aisa and could benefit of his presence. Immense is the richness of the gifts received from the Sheikh in the form of private interviews, oral reminders, muzakarat, addressed at the meetings, and in the form of inspired pages copied with his fine writing and aimed at accompanying and supporting the meditation. At his contact, and thanks to his penetrating vision of things and beings, 
to the subtle analysis of spiritual anthropology presented in his books like Cast and Races, Castes and Races, or Images of the Spirit. We learned how to recognize the presence of the divine in the various traditions of humanity. Those which have left only traces, as well as those which are still alive. Like in the case of Red Indians, with whom Shuan had built up brotherly relations and whose features he has fixed in his paintings. Sheikh Aisa has been an extraordinary master. Swami Ramdas, who has met him in London, wrote in his souvenirs, he is an avatar. Since the first time when I was in his presence and forever afterwards, he inspired me reverence and love. He was very impressing with his grave face and majestic calm. The Sheikh said that there are three ways of chasing away the thoughts that assail us. The invocation, first, dhikr. The individual prayer, the dua. And the reflection, tafakku, meditation, you may say also. Invocation allows us to stay in the divine presence. These are his words. Individual prayer allows us to speak with God as with a human being. And reflection consists in looking at the causes of phenomena and seeing them in their relativity. It was very important. It is a thing that the Sheikh possessed equality to the, an extreme degree. He warned against the tendency to perfectionism in spiritual life. He has written, I quote, don't force you to arrive at perfect, I, at perfect concentration. This brings into the invocation a false and bitter element, which is worse than simple distraction. Heaven does not demand from us perfection, but demands sincerity. And he added uh, also very, very often perseverance. But let me just read my last uh, words. Uh, it is not long. Dear friends, last year at the end of the first interview I have ever given on my spiritual itinerary, that was two years ago, I was asked to say what kind of message I would like to leave for the young generations. You are all young, so I have to read that. <laughs> this, is, this is what I answered, I quote myself. To my contemporaries, those of all the generations, I will say, just as I say it to myself, prepare yourselves for the encounter with God. It is he who has granted us an invaluable gift, intelligence, which man alone possesses along all created beings. Intelligence is the link with him. It runs all our psychic and bodily faculties. And if turned toward the Supreme Lord, lit by its light, it gives to any one of us the possibility to know himself better and to direct himself toward what is good for him. So, God bless us all. Thank you. <laughs>